Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ron Ackerman, uh, Director of the Institute for Public Health and Medicine and Senior Associate Dean for Public Health at Feinberg School of Medicine. I wanna welcome you all today to an annual presentation that we've been doing uh, for several years now, uh, which celebrates a year in review of uh, work done in IFAM, as well as uh, uh, a reflection on the present and uh, hopefully a dialogue uh, to the extent we can do that in Zoom uh, uh, regarding the future and, and our work to come. Uh, I am going to uh, begin uh, with, sorry, my slides aren't advancing. I'm going to begin with uh, a short description uh, of who we are, what we do in IFAM. Uh, I'm gonna pose some questions for you to consider, but as I'll tell you in a moment, I would encourage you at any point during the presentation to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen to pose any questions or comments that you'd like us to uh, enter into the discussion in the last 15 minutes of the presentation today. Uh, I'm going to then spend a little bit of time recognizing some awards uh, that, uh, uh, that have come through IFAM uh, this past year and its, uh, its members. Uh, we're going to talk just a little bit, a few things that are uh, kind of new or happening as we speak, uh, and then pivot to a discussion about uh, our future state. So to begin with who we are and what we do, I begin with a uh, bit of a short uh, or a, uh, an abbreviated timeline of, of where we began to illustrate a point that public health and medicine has really been part of Feinberg since its uh, very beginnings. Uh, the Chicago Medical College was established in, uh, on the corner of uh, Wacker and Randolph in the Loop in 1859 uh, by faculty who had left Russia's medical school and nurses at uh, Mercy. Uh, they together established the Chicago Medical College, which eventually became a permanent part of Northwestern University and uh, formed the, the base or the roots of the medical school. Uh, through many years of surviving the fire and a lot of uh, pandemics and other challenges uh, in public health over, over 50 years, uh, the medical school uh, began to grow and needed a new location. And it bought land on an undeveloped swamp or backfill in Lake Michigan, uh, where we are today in Streeterville or the Gold Coast, and dedicated in 1925 the Chicago campus uh, as part of that uh, initial campus, uh, our medical school included uh, a Department of Social Service, uh, free health care, and a vision for greater impact through the city of Chicago. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, as the medical school evolved, we uh, established a Department of Community Health and Preventive Medicine, which continues to exist through today uh, as our Department of Preventive Medicine. Within that department in 1974, we graduated our first Master of Public Health trainee, and that program grew over many decades uh, to a very strong program that exists today, and I'll talk more about that. In 2012, uh, building on the strengths uh, in many departments at the medical school and other institutes, we were uh, fortunate to establish our Institute for Public Health and Medicine as something that would serve to extend public health strengths across the departments, integrate them, and amplify our impact um, by engaging with community partners throughout the region. Today, uh, it's important to understand that our institute, uh, like most institutes at the university, uh, it exists with a membership model. All of our faculty are appointed in a department here. Uh, many are in the medical school, but others are throughout six schools throughout Northwestern's campus. Um, we have 500 members in IFAM in 51 divisions or departments across those six schools. They organize themselves in 16 thematic centers, one focused on um, uh, education and the other 16 on varied uh, areas of research and service. Uh, the members of those centers, those 500 members are responsible for about $204 million in extramural grant funding. And we support through, uh, through the Institute, uh, both in the Center for Education and in some of our other centers, 316 students uh, through five master's programs and a single 
uh, Health Services Integrated PhD program. Uh, we work through our values. Uh, the values uh, uh, guide our strategies and, uh, and our goals and objectives. Uh, they include impact, justice, health equity, diversity, respect, collaboration, research excellence, and the sharing of our knowledge and benefits with all partners. Um, these are the uh, directors of our centers today. Um, it's a very uh, collaborative group spanning multiple departments uh, and fields. We operate a research administration that's available to any of our members uh, who either don't have access to research administration or prefer to use uh, the research administration with familiarity in, in large collaborative multi-departmental grants. In the last year, this group, uh, including uh, Monica Lagarde, uh, Will, uh, Will Edwards, Tiffany Lesage, uh, Kathy Mazka, uh, Julene Morford, uh, Norman Morris, Lizette Rubio, and Sara Zayadin. Uh, they are responsible for the, basically managing 157 proposals, totaling $176 million. Um, they also uh, support the post-award um, management of 133 active grant awards, totaling $34.4 million. So our research administration does a large volume of research support. Uh, for 72 uh, faculties, uh, faculty members, and six trainees in the in the across the institute and multiple of our departments, excuse me, our centers. They also support uh, the pre and post award uh, research administrative services for two other institutes, including the Institute for Global Health and the Institute for Augmented Intelligence and Medicine. Want to really acknowledge their strong work. We believe that we have one of the probably the best research administration uh, in in the school and possibly on campus. Um, we operate a seminar series. In the last year, we uh, as you're attending today, we uh, we held 33 seminars last year with 3,300 attendees. Uh, IFAM collaborated with other groups to to um, extend the the diversity and the reach of those seminars. Uh, including a focus on careers in public health, uh, translational applications in public health, which we uh, did collaboratively with the New Cats Institute, and some collaborative seminars with the Institute for Policy Research on the Northwestern Evanston campus. Um, we've had uh, several really outstanding presenters uh, in, in, in the fields of public health from both in and outside of Northwestern. Uh, and we continue to strive to have the highest standard for our seminar series to uh, really invite dialogue and, and uh, engage people in new ideas and, and new work in public health. Uh, we strive continually, continuously to make an impact on community engagement. Um, and a lot of that is uh, really administered through our Center for Community Health, which is supported both by IFAM and the New Cats Institute here at Northwestern. Um, the Center for Community Health provides financial support to build partnerships between Northwestern faculty and community stakeholders. Uh, over the last about 12 years, it's administered over a million dollars in seed grants for community academic partnerships. So that's money flowing into those partnerships and new work that's collaborative and community engaged. Uh, and uh, a lot of that money actually flows through uh, to provide direct benefit to community partners uh, engaged in, in work with us. Um, they've also provided education and consultation for faculty uh, seeking to work more effectively and equitably with communities. So um, their work has actually extended uh, to members uh, throughout the Institute over the years, not just those who sit in the Center for Community Health, and that includes over 300 faculty in 15 departments. Uh, the group actively maintains partnerships or contact with 500 community partners who have either been previously part of the governance structure called the ARC Steering Committee uh, or have been seed or pilot grant award uh, uh, recipients uh, or have been engaged and supported in community engaged research partnerships. Um, so, we strive to maintain those partnerships and, and continue to uh, align our research with the priorities of, of those groups. 
Um, the uh, importantly, in the last year with the coronavirus pandemic, uh, the Center for Community Health also partnered with other centers like the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research, as well as New Cats and the Division of General Internal Medicine to award $140,000 in COVID response and recovery grants to 28 organizations. And that was to directly address and support community members and communities uh, to uh, understand and address the coronavirus pandemic locally. Our Center for Education and the Health Sciences uh, supports all but one of our master's programs in IFAM. Uh, our master of public health program has grown tremendously over the last few years to 170 active trainees. Uh, our master of science health care quality and patient safety uh, supports 28 trainees. Our master of science health services and outcomes research 41 trainees. Our MS in biostatistics, which is also part of our program in public health, 18 trainees. Uh, and then we support through our health services integrated PhD program 32 uh, PhD candidates and um, also in the center, five postdoctoral fellowship positions, 294 total trainees supported by our center, uh, which integrates, uh, you know, and, and uh, supports uh, coursework development, um, competency based education, and uh, also uh, helping to consolidate and streamline recruitment and support of students, um, as well as diversity and equity initiatives um, throughout uh, the, uh, the educational programs in IFAM. Uh, our center has some other highlights. Uh, the, as I said, you know, the Master of Public Health program has increased uh, in, in new in 2021, we have 62 uh, public health uh, trainees and as, as uh, newly joining. So the, I, I believe the largest for the second year, uh, the largest uh, entering master public health class that we've had, um, lots of interest in public health training nationally. And, and we've been able to grow uh, nimbly to support a larger uh, uh, number of trainees, which I think um, benefits the, the field of public health by turning out future leaders. Uh, but also uh, affords us opportunities to do more work collaboratively with community partners in their training, as well as to engage those individuals in service activities and in, um, in, in uh, uh, mentored research. Uh, our HSIP program also is, is, has grown up 24% in its size from 2021. Um, so we continue to grow in these areas and aspire to providing the strongest uh, educational experience as possible in, in public and population health. Um, we uh, also, uh, through the center, uh, support uh, service learning and other forms of embedded education that has bi-directional benefit for community partners. And uh, the center supports engagement with 55 community organizations, specifically the program in public health, which supports a lot of most of these placements as partnering with the Augusta Weber Office for Medical Education here at the Feinberg School of Medicine uh, to further along um, Feinberg's goals for social justice by enhancing how public health and medical students can engage together and coordinate the efforts to um, have the training occur more in community settings and engaging with community organizations in ways that has benefit for our community partners. Um, the HSIP program uh, also is developing a new PhD track in biostatistics. We're all excited about that and it will be accepting its first applicants in uh, for fall of 2022. Um, and uh, HSIP now includes um, uh, four students from the medical scientist training program, Feinberg's dual MD PhD program. Um, so we're ex excited about those, uh, those advances this year. Uh, last year in the presentation, I announced that uh, Neil Jordan was the acting director of, of, center, of the Center for Education. He was made the permanent director in November of 2020. Uh, Lucy Belaver is now the director for the Health Services Integrated PhD program, and Richard Epstein is the newly appointed associate director of the Health Services Integrated PhD program since May of 2021. 
We also are proud of, uh, you know, a number of other training programs throughout our centers. I'll mention a few today. Uh, this one, importantly, uh, is uh, very unique in, in, in its sense of supporting uh, uh, basically health disparities research training experiences uh, for students in, in who might otherwise be underrepresented in, in uh, uh, in, in uh, the fields of, uh, of research as well as uh, just, just in um, healthcare and healthcare professions. Um, the, uh, uh, this is a five-year training grant led by Dr. Melissa Simon, the director of the Center for Health Equity Transformation. And uh, since its launch in 2019, it supported 23 trainees. Uh, the program is currently seeking applications for a deadline in March of 2022. So please visit the website. Uh, learn more about the program and uh, refer anybody you think that might benefit from the training. So I want to, you know, uh, sort of, I've given you an overview of the types of activities that I think are happening in the Institute or throughout the Institute. Um, I want to take pause just because uh, it's a really unique time <laughs> in the world. And, um, you know, I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't stop to talk a little bit about uh, the fatigue about the challenges we're all facing and about what's happening in the world around us. So I wanna spend a little time talking about this first now by posing a few questions for you to maybe prompt you to use the Q and A um, as, as we introduced in the beginning. Uh, and you can enter those questions or comments into the Q and A at any point during, uh, during this uh, presentation. But it's now 20 months into the coronavirus pandemic in terms of when um, we had the first cases no, noticed in Chicago at the end of February of 2020. Um, and, you know, I, I guess one quintessential question is how are we all feeling about our work in public health? It was very inspiring last year to um, drop what we were doing and really just all roll up our sleeves and do whatever we knew how to do to support a response to the pandemic. Um, as the pandemic has trickled on, a lot of things have happened. We've continue to work remotely largely, although we're making progress towards entering campus, uh, at least some of us, uh, but we're disconnected to some extent from other coworkers. I think there's some uncertainty about how to feel about returning to the office and uh, what it'll be like when we get there. And, and if we're in the office already, is it, is it always safe? Um, it, it conjures up fears. It conjures up fears because some of us use public transit to get here or have family members that might have immune compromise or be sick or be small children. Um, we also on the news every day see social conflict about public health, um, where we had a zenith last year in, in public sort of acknowledgement and perceptions about, about public health and its role and its importance. And it's led to record uh, admissions to our public health training programs. There's also been a pendulum swing of, of reports of uh, even death threats against public health agency leaders and a lot of violence and um, conflict around uh, public health uh, policies and mandates and the role of public health in, uh, in, in, uh, in our economy or in our society. Um, so, you know, this sometimes might cause some of us to wonder, am I doing this for the right reasons? Do I want to keep doing this? Um, how can I engage more meaningfully to help um, maybe reconcile some of this conflict? Or um, how do I reconnect? How do I get inspiration from my work? So I, I know a lot of you are thinking about that because you've contacted me about it. And I, I um, share your sentiments in many ways. And I, I just want to spend a little time at the end of the presentation today thinking and talking a bit about that. Um, so please feel free to enter any thoughts or comments. And specifically, um, you know, we spend a lot of our time, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about recruitment of new faculty and support of junior faculty and the development of new grants and centers and lots of activities happen in IFAM every year. But are there other things where we should be placing our focus in the Institute that you think maybe we're not doing enough of, or maybe we should consider more in the, in the years ahead? Are there ways in which we should be rethinking the ways in which we do our work in, in, um, in the context of the world around us and what I just shared is happening, but also our, our ongoing hybrid work uh, sort of experience that we have? Um, 
And importantly, how can our institute help you gain more inspiration from your work as a scientist or as a uh, agent for change in public health? Um, we want to be able to support that. And if there are ways you think we can do that better, we want to know. So again, use the Q&A function to enter your thoughts or questions. Um, I want to spend a little time. Uh, these are some of the new faculty we help to recruit into some of our centers and our new members of IFAM. Uh, Lindsay Allen is a health economist uh, and health services researcher uh, who's come into the Bueller Center. Uh, her research aims to uncover the impact of state and federal policies on healthcare use, quality, and outcomes. Uh, our expertise includes substance abuse disorders, Medicaid, and acute care delivery models. Salva Balbale is, uh, has expertise in health. Oh, she's come into the Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research uh, and has uh, expertise and interest in health services, patient safety, and outcomes research. Her primary interests are identifying and implementing innovative approaches to make healthcare delivery safer, better, coordinated, and more patient centered, particularly for patients with gastrointestinal disorders. Ashley Dyer is in the Center for uh, Food Allergy and Asthma Research. She has 15 years of public health experience and works on developing integrated health education, uh, integrative health education and incorporating natural medicine strategies into patient-centered healthcare. Her current work focuses on quality of life for children and adults and families managing food allergy and developing integrative medicine research. Um, Carol Hayward, uh, who's joined our Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research is an occupational therapist. Uh, she has health services, she's also a health services researcher and she applies qualitative and mixed methods uh, study, study designs uh, to, the lived, to study the lived experience uh, of disability and address inequities in access uh, to care across the lifespan. Patty Lee King, uh, also joining our Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research, directs the collaborative operations and implements statewide quality improvement initiatives uh, providing quality improvement support for about 120 birthing hospitals through the Illinois Perinatal Quality Collaborative. Alex Lundberg, also in Bueller, is an applied microeconomist. He's trained in statistical methods and causal inference designs. His research centers on violence, illegal markets, social networks, and citizen interactions with the justice system. And finally, last but not least, Christopher Warren, who's in our Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research, um, is uh, focused on characterizing and ameliorating the population level burden of food allergy, asthma, and other atopic diseases using epidemiologic and preventive science approaches. So I welcome all of our new faculty. And if you haven't met them yet and you're interested in what they do, please feel free to reach out. I want to recognize um, in our Center for uh, Applied Health Research on Aging, or CARA, uh, they've, through a, a P30 grant, the Pepper Center grant, been able to support a uh, junior faculty uh, uh, Pepper Center Scholars Program, which are like miniature uh, small K awards uh, that support uh, pilot grants and career development activities. Uh, very briefly, uh, the, the trainees supported this year include Mary Claire Masters, uh, whose research is broadly focused on addressing a psychosocial determinants of chronic disease self-management in older adults, um, with a special interest on um, adults contending with multiple chronic conditions. Marquita Lewis Thames uh, is a community-engaged health disparities researcher. Uh, with interests in chronic and cancer disease management for rural and African American populations. Whitney Welch is an exercise physiologist whose research focuses on increasing physical activity in populations at high risk for inactivity, with an emphasis on preventing or managing chronic conditions. Rebecca Lovett uh, is a clinical psychologist whose research is broadly focused on addressing uh, psycho, psychosocial determinants of chronic disease self-management among older adults with one or more chronic conditions and with a special interest in uh, those with multiple chronic conditions. And then Emma Barber's uh, 
research focuses on surgical quality and improving the postoperative recovery period so that patients experience fewer complications and recover more quickly. I want to recognize another uh, K, uh, institutional K program, the K-12 um, Chicago Center for Excellence in Learning Health Systems Research Training, or Accelerate. Uh, the trainees include, uh, new trainees, in, or current trainees include Raj uh, Chobatia. Uh, Raj is uh, in the Department of Dermatology. His research interests include patients' uh, reported outcomes, health services, research, epidemiology, implementation science, and the development of novel therapeutics. Jennifer Hoffman is in the Division of Emergency Medicine and at Lurie Children's Hospital. Her research aims to develop quality measures for acute agitation management in the emergency department that are informed by uh, multi-stakeholder perspectives, including patients and families. Nisha Mohindra is a medical oncologist at uh, the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center of Chicago. Uh, and uh, her work uh, focuses on the treatment of lung cancer. Her research will focus on um, uh, how to adapt and utilize shared decision-making using a dashboard uh, during telemedicine encounters. Julie Konchak uh, is um, an addiction medicine and public health preventive medicine physician at Cook County Health. Julie's research is focused on improving access to evidence-based substance abuse disorder treatment for individuals uh, in community corrections. And Faith Somerset Williams uh, is a pediatric psychologist at Lurie Children's Hospital, where she provides mental health support for divi the division's growing substance abuse and prevention program. Faith is a first year scholar focused on establishing a system wide standard of care uh, with a pediatric within a pediatric hospital. So congratulations also to these uh, K award trainees. We also have some independent K award trainees and um, Marquita here on the heels of her uh, pepper center K award and I think another K award actually uh, uh, managed to also get uh, receive an independent K award. Um, her uh, K award focuses on improving adherence to post treatment follow up care for rural lung cancer survivors through a community clinical survivorship uh, care team model. Rachel O'Connor, who's in the Center for Applied Health Research on Aging, was awarded a K award with a focus on management of complex medication regimens among older adults with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias and their caregivers. Ann Stay, uh, who's in the Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research, was awarded a, K, a new K award um, focused on timeliness of management of trauma-related hemorrhage and trauma-related coagulopathy. Neela Shah, who's uh, a member of the Center for Community Health, was awarded a K award focused on multi-level assessment of South Asian life course of atherosclerosis, part of the second uh, generation offspring study. Rupal Mehta, who's a member of the Center for Translational Metabolism and Health, was awarded a K award with a focus on pathogenesis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in chronic kidney disease. Faraz Ahmed, in the Center for Health Information Partnerships was awarded a K award for electronic health record nudges to improve quality of care in heart failure. And Rina Fox in our Center for Behavioral Behavior and Health was awarded a K award focused on improving sleep in gynecologic cancer survivors. So we're really proud of our um, junior faculty career development K awardees. Um, uh, as well as our established K award K, uh, uh, who have had their awards but weren't newly awarded this year. Uh, I wish I had more time to talk about all of them. Um, we also have two mid-career mentor awardees. Uh, and this is an important award that covers 25 to 50 percent of a faculty member's time to focus on mentoring others and to develop new areas for their own work uh, that create mentoring opportunities for junior faculty. Nami Kandula um, uh, in the Center for Community Health received a new K-24 award in this past year 
uh, focused on mentoring in community engaged implementation research to reduce cardiovascular disparities. And Tamara Isakova in our Center for Translational Metabolism and Health is now in the second year of her mentor, uh, excuse me, of her K24 mentoring award uh, with a focus on mentored patient oriented research of novel mechanisms for cardiovascular disease in patients with chronic kidney disease. So congratulations on these mentoring achievements. We also have some first time R01 award winners, which is really, um, you know, an important part in, a, in the career development of, of a junior uh, kind of going into mid-career faculty member. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to highlight a few that were newly awarded this year, uh, and people that didn't previously have an R01 level award. Um, Siobhan, Siobhan Phillips is in our Center for Behavior and Health. Uh, her R01 focuses on optimization of M Health physical activity promotion intervention with mindful awareness for adolescent and young adult cancer survivors. Emily Miller and Craig Garfield are, co are co MPIs of a new R01. They're both new R01 award winners. Uh, the uh, topic is bridging gaps in healthcare services for new families due to COVID-19. Hassan Gamrawi is in the Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research. His R01 focuses on social determinants and timeliness of total knee replacement, a national perspective. Sadia Khan uh, received uh, her first R01 in the area of patterns for cardiopulmonary health across the life course. Emily Latte, uh, received her first R01 in the area of implementation of digital mental health tools in ambulatory care coordination. And Nabil Al Sharafa in the Center for Behavior and Health received an R01 for EAT, a reliable eating assessment technology for free living individuals. Congratulations on a first R01. I want to recognize these national award winners as well uh, Tara Lagu who is accepted as a uh, member of this year's cohort for Hedwig Van uh, Ameringen Executive Leadership in Academic Medicine. She's a fellow in that training program. Uh, uh, the, um, for, for those of you who uh, can't, can't uh, discern from the long title, that's the ELAM uh, uh, <laughs> Executive Leadership Training Program. Uh, Melissa Simon was uh, recently voted a new member of the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, congratulations, Melissa, on such a, an exceptional accomplishment in your career. Uh, and Bonnie Spring was uh, received an award as, society, uh, as the, the Distinguished Scientist Award from the Society of Behavioral Medicine. Congratulations, Bonnie. Um, Additional awards, uh, congratulations to Human Azad. Uh, Human uh, received, this is a student uh, receiving a national award given to medical students who are public health champions advancing the US Public Health Service mission to protect and promote and advance the health and safety of our nation. Um, so congratulations, Human. Uh, Jen Brown, uh, received a award from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute as an advisory panel member on patient engagement. And finally, uh, Deb Clements, the chair of our Department of Family Medicine, uh, was uh, 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 received an award from the Illinois Academy of Family Physicians, the 2021 Distinguished Service Award. Congratulations to these award winners as well. Now I want to mention just um, a few things. Oh, excuse me. Uh, actually, I'll talk briefly. These are uh, leading into a few things that are happening now or new. I want to make you aware that um, I'm proud to say we recently collaborated together with the University of Chicago on a new P30 uh, core center grant funded by the National Institutes of Digestive Diabetes and Kidney Diseases. Uh, NIDDK funds seven of these centers nationally. So to have one of these in, in Chicago is a great achievement. To have a multi-center P30 is something we're really proud of um, because the focus is actually to provide a Chicago-wide hub for training, mentoring, and research that advances health equity in the prevention and management of diabetes. 
Um, we're proud to join with our colleagues at University of Chicago in leading the Institute, excuse me, the center, as well as each of its cores uh, and programs. Um, the, the center will operate a pilot feasibility program, uh, an enrichment program, uh, and three local cores, one on implement, uh, intervention design and implementation science, one on research design and analytics, and one on community engagement and health equity, uh, all collaboratively led by individuals here at Northwestern and at University of Chicago. We also uh, received a supplemental national core, which um, will be led by Marshall Chin, Matt O'Brien, and the Alliance Chicago, as well as the um, Clinical Directors Network uh, and Midwest Clinicians Network. So it's, it's a collaboratively uh, led core that um, is led jointly by community uh, stakeholders in uh, these large uh, federally qualified health center networks and our, um, our, our respective uh, uh, colleges or universities to build collaborative research that addresses health disparities and achieves health equity in FQHC patients throughout the country. So we're really excited about that. You can learn more um, uh, over the coming year. There'll be more announcements about membership in the center and opportunities for pilot award funding, as well as access to core resources. Um, I want to talk a little bit now about some other present state activities, just so you're aware that they're continuing to happen. Um, in the last uh, few months, Northwestern uh, Magazine uh, published an article on science and practice, and it highlighted work being done by some of these individuals and others that focuses on trying to do research that specifically is designed around uh, busy practice settings, active policy or practice um, priorities, and to design the research in a way that we can understand how to implement it best, whether it's scalable, um, and whether we can continue to sustain it. So it really is um, uh, uh, a foundation for uh, growth in the area of implementation science. Um, many of you know that this is an area that we are doing more of in, in, in IFAM, and what I'm showing here on the right panel is a graph depicting the year-by-year -year funding out of um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So this is, you, you could generate this same report and project reporter uh, searching all awards funded with the keywords implementation research, implementation science, or effective, effectiveness implementation studies. And um, the awards have taken off dramatically since 2017 to 2020. Uh, creating an opportunity for funding, but also prioritizing an interest in generalizable knowledge about how to implement research best practices or uh, emerging efficacy uh, evidence in practice settings in ways that's sustainable and replicable. Um, we tend to think about implementation science as uh, from the left side of this slide, the, the things that work, the things that come from efficacy research, uh, the things we uh, maybe learn from in practice guidelines or meta-analyses, but we want to know, um, are they being implemented? If they're being implemented, are they being implemented with fidelity to how they were studied in the efficacy studies? Who are they reaching? Are they reaching the intended audience? Are they reaching those who need or could benefit most, meaning um, health equity or inequity populations or those facing health disparities? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, is it being done over time consistently? Is it sustainable within busy care delivery settings or public health practice settings or communities? And if it's done at a local basis, can it be repli replicated or scaled elsewhere? Um, so it's important that these additional questions are addressed and the field of implementation science strives to do that. Um, so we have, um, I'm sorry, we have continued to try to, um, deepen our focus on uh, identifying. We have an active search now. We have actually multiple searches open across multiple departments here at Feinberg for people who will do faculty members doing work in implementation science. Um, we're hiring staff on new grants that have implementation aims, and we're hiring a uh, school-wide leader in the area of implementation science, and that's through a collaboration with um, many of the leaders in implementation science across our campus, 
as well as uh, folks within the NUCAST Institute and in IFAM. So we're excited to continue to strive to move that forward and address the ongoing need for more expertise in that area locally. Um, I wanna say a little bit about activities and progress in health equity and social justice. Um, we continue to do work collaboratively with multiple groups to try to uh, elevate and center our work on health equity and justice as uh, important values of our institute. Uh, we've partnered with the Center for Community Health to create a full-time position with, uh, for a community co-director of the Alliance for Research in Chicagoland Communities. Um, in the last year, we posted that as a half-time position We've hired um, Shahara Wass into that position and, and are working now to create a full-time position as uh, the importance of that work is, remains not forgotten and we continue to need to provide more support to engaging with our community partners and centering our work on community priorities and community voices. We've also partnered with the Augusta Weber uh, Office of Medical Education within Feinberg School of Medicine to create a community engagement coordinator position within the program of public health. So this will align with um, uh, efforts already ongoing for many years and done well within our program of public health to um, provide immersive learning opportunities for our students um, as part of our APEX uh, program and to um, basically do applied practice uh, education within our community uh, settings. Something uh, the, the medical school is developing something where groups of medical students will spend time doing work uh, in community settings, helping with community uh, needs assessments and asset assessments, and then trying to help the community partners develop strategies and implement those strategies. So the support for placing those students and supporting our community uh, organizational partners in that work will be aligned and um, led by this new position. Uh, we also partnered with Northwestern Medicine to invest in something that they are calling the Health Equity Action Training, uh, or HEAT. And uh, what, what it does is um, really, uh, it, it's trying to uh, train teams of healthcare providers to um, learn how to set goals and measurable objectives around health equity um, activities or initiatives. Um, so this is a, a collaborative group, a group effort, and uh, we're, we're uh, providing resources together with the health system to try to move this effort forward. Um, so these are just three examples of ways in which we've been trying to partner with others to, to continually elevate and center on health equity. Um, so, you know, uh, partly on that and the concept of justice, I want to come back to something. This is a bit of a pivot, but I think it centers the conversation I'd like to now have. Um, you know, dating back about a year now, um, if you can train your eyes to move around these pictures, um, what you're looking at is uh, conflict, social conflict uh, that's emerged around public health policies and actions. Some of it around uh, masks, some of it around uh, 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 the emerging uh, uh, discourse uh, in, in local settings around and in national settings around mandates for the uh, for, for um, vaccinations. Um, spanning Boston to LA to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, we've had uh, everything from uh, stabbings of counter protesters to um, people uh, really kind of voicing that this is an infringement of their personal autonomy and rights. Um, so, uh, and, and then in the upper right, I want to highlight that, um, you know, this is scary. Uh, you know, on October 16th, uh, this is uh, a New York Times article just from a couple of days ago, Dr. Allison Berry, uh, local health officer of uh, Clallam County in Washington State, has received death threats over uh, pandemic response work. And she that, this is happening all over the country. So I wanna highlight the, the stress that this creates. Um, and I wanna point out a couple of things because I think we all have a potential role and in, 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 in we may be wondering how, uh, how we can contribute to, to resolving some of this or how we should um, use our public health training to an advantage. Um, we certainly know that through social media and other um, sources, there is contradictory information being streamed through all over the place about 
uh, calling into question the magnitude and severity of the coronavirus uh, epidemic or pandemic, uh, as well as the efficacy and safety of, of vaccination. And, um, you know, some people have trouble uh, discerning which data sources to trust, especially if they're getting this from their social network or people they trust. And it develops into this group think of, of oh, this might be true because people I, I know are sharing it. And, uh, you know, if, if a lot of people share it, there must be something to consider about it. Um, so some people don't really fundamentally understand how vaccines work. And when we see cases of people that who've been vaccinated um, uh, getting tested positive for coronavirus several months later or, or even getting hospitalized, we contest that the vaccines must not be working. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a role we can play there. There's also issues of mistrust or distrust that are inherent um, to our relationship with many segments of society. And to come in and, and have ads or, or uh, public service announcements and say, trust us, um, you know, there's just so much fundamental distrust in some segments of our population that we need more direct dialogue to overcome some of the challenges. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be difficult to have help people through which data to trust and understand. Um, it's important to understand that I think fundamentally we can assume that all humans have multiple values that include both justice, social justice, community justice, uh, benefit of, uh, of something I do on others, even though there might not be direct benefit from me. Uh, and then the, the, the other being my own personal autonomy and my ability to make my own decisions and decide what goes into my body. Some people who don't understand um, how their, uh, their own, I, I think some people do not fundamentally understand how a vaccination of themselves affects a community. Um, if I perceive I'm at low risk of, inf of infection, why do I get a vaccine? I don't really understand how my decision affects others. And I think we have a role in maybe having more dialogue with people about that. It's also important to understand that everybody kind of weighs this differently based on their understanding of whether the vaccine is more healthful or harmful and whether their direct action on themselves is gonna benefit themselves or whether it's gonna benefit others. I think there's a differential weighting people have in their own minds of um, whether you know, they're, gonna, they're gonna weigh their own autonomy higher or justice higher. And in some pa patient pop or people in some populations, um, the benefit to self, it, is also um, part of the social justice. So these two things can align. But I think a lot of times when we see conflict, it's because people are weighing their own autonomy or, or feeling that the decision to, that, that we do in public health a lot of times to mandate on behalf of the vulnerable or on behalf of the good of the many is an infringement on autonomy. And um, I think we have a role in understanding that it's not people's misread of the data or that they're you know, they're foolish or we need to pound our own data sources into them, but it's really a need for dialogue about fundamentally um, why we're at conflict, what are your concerns, and a lot of times when this has been done in prior vaccine conflicts uh, involving prior mandates of other vaccines, it's often that it's just an unequal weighting. And, you know, it's not that we're looking for uh, a unanimity, right? They're, they're, um, and, and we can't always base public health policy on even a majority opinion, but there needs to be more dialogue. And I think we can have a special role in that process. So I'm going to stop there in presenting my slides. There's about 12 or 13 minutes left. Um, I just want to maybe talk a little bit now. Please feel free to use the Q&A area uh, if you have any thoughts or questions or want to react to this issue of conflict or how we can um, use our, um, uh, you know, to some extent, our power and privilege as scientists, as members in the Northwestern community to try to help um, uh, dispel some of the conflict out there now and to try to do more work in um, helping to uh, create a focus on social justice that allows us to uh, forward the efforts around uh, community vaccination that we know will help us uh, all be safer. Um, if you want to talk about other things, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, there is some questions in, in, in the Q&A. Um, I, I have one that says, uh, thank you for sharing the various health equity and social justice related initiatives. Based on your presentation, there's an evident underrepresentation of African-American and Latino investigators among IFAM's 
senior and junior researchers, what are your plans to begin creating equity around cultural diversity gap within IFAM? So this is a really great question. Um, I, I think that um, you know we need to recognize as a Northwestern community that um, you know we uh, our faculty to do not equivalently represent the demographic composition of the Chicago community. Um, we need to do better in, in uh, um, basically the diversity and inclusivity for, uh, for minority or those historically underrepresented in science and in uh, medical training and in uh, places like medical schools. We are certainly no exception. Um, we have been uh, working with uh, several groups on our faculty recruitments whenever we have faculty recruitments. Uh, we have tried to deepen our process of, of focus on making sure that the everything from the job position listing, the way that it's structured, the way that the search is conducted, follows uh, provost recommendations that have been put together across campus to try to enhance and improve uh, the diversity of our applicant, uh, the way in which applicants are judged and selected for interviews, and then the ultimate selection process. All of our search processes have diversity representative on the search committee. Their role is to make sure that we follow all of those policies. Um, we uh, are trying uh, to not um, sort of uh, default to maybe what historically might happen where we don't get a lot of um, uh, uh, diverse uh, applicants to a particular uh, faculty offering or a faculty uh, uh, posting or even in staff postings and say, well, we just, we, our hands are tied. We, we can't get enough applicants. It's not our fault. Uh, we don't have a, a sufficiently diverse applicant pool. Uh, it's our responsibility to try to, uh, um, to build up the applicant pool. So we've been trying to do that in other ways. Um, I showed one program where there are multiple others like the uh, Northwestern Scholars and a number of others that we've been uh, if you uh, look at the, uh, we have a website for uh, Feinberg community engagement that is uh, beginning to list some of these things, but we've been trying to inventory across our affiliates, across all of the campuses, the programs that are creating opportunities for even uh, elementary, middle, middle school and um, high school, as well as undergraduate students to get immersive opportunities uh, to learn more about health, um, uh, basically health related professions and uh, get exposed directly to the medical school. Uh, we do that, uh, we're, we're developing uh, also a mentoring program that will span into the uh, undergraduate campus. Uh, I showed Melissa's uh, uh, T37 award, which focuses on health equity training, particularly among um, uh, young people who are, are trying to uh, gain interest and expertise in, in health equity and, and enter professions in this area. So we're mindful that there's a pipeline that we have to begin to foster um, so that we will continue to have a, an increasingly diverse applicant pool. We also work with our Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, and I know they keep very detailed statistics about um, how we at Feinberg and uh, within our institute uh, particularly have continued to uh, improve slowly in some of these areas. We're still not where we want to be, uh, but we're, we're, we're keeping an eye on the metrics. We're trying to constantly reevaluate our strategies, and it, it is an important focus. Um, you know, we showed pictures. I think your question reacts to the pictures of people um, that uh, they may not um, reflect the full diversity. I, I think um, that may be true. I, I think we have a, a, you know, to the extent that, um, you know, we are uh, an institute that's comprised of Northwestern University faculty and staff, as well as our partners. I think the faculty and staff who are members of IFAM um, are amongst the most diverse in the medical school. And, and I think part of it is because of the opportunities they have for collaborative work in, in important areas. So um, your point's well taken. I, you know, it's a focus we need to deepen and we will continue to work in this area, but it's, um, it's certainly, I, I think we, we didn't show pictures of all of the senior faculty and all of the junior faculty, but 
Um, it, either way, I, I don't mean to uh, to argue your point. I think that it's some place that we we need to uh, continually do better. So it's an area where we'll continue to focus. If you have anybody on the call has particular thoughts about how to be more purposeful or successful in in some of those, um, I, I invite you to you know either email me. Uh, you can. Um, enter your suggestions through the Office of Equity, uh, Diversity, Equity, and uh, in Inclusion and, and in the medical school, or, or even um, follow up with the, uh, the IFAM inbox on our website. Um, we've got another question. I think you raised some important issues about violence against researchers, because I do violence. This is uh, Dr. Post who directs our, our Bueller Center. Because I do violence research that involves guns and mass shootings, I've always lived uh, in this politicized backdrop and I've experienced threats and stalkers. If anybody's worried about safety, feel free to reach out, especially if anybody is stalking at work or at home. So th this, is, this is really important. And um, you know, I, I kind of led with, I know we're all feeling stressed. We're all sort of um, at, at this weird point in, in our history uh, struggling with being inspired about pub, uh, our role in public health and questioning, you know, things like return to work and, and there's violence. And uh, what I didn't say is, you know, um, if people have, um, you know, really deep feelings about that or have experienced uh, threats or um, absolutely please, uh, you know, know that, uh, that we're here to support you. Um, Lori's providing herself as one, uh, one, one option, please feel free uh, to let us know. Um, there's also ways to report that at the medical school. Um, and and I, I would encourage you not to hold back and to report those sorts of experiences because we need to surface those and make them visible if we're to ha hopefully address them. Um, you know, I don't see any other questions in the Q and A uh, at this time. We've got three minutes left. I um, want to thank you all for attending today. Um, the uh, uh, I'm getting a hold on. There's another question coming, but the I uh, as I'm talking, I just want to thank everybody for their work, um, and I want to particularly give a shout out to our staff. Um, in the past, we've sort of had a Wordle slide with everybody's name on it, and I and I think. You know what's important is to recognize uh, that we have over 120 staff supported in the Institute for Public Health and Medicine. They continue to keep us afloat and support all that we do, and we're really proud of our staff. Um, I want to recognize all of them, but particularly, um, you know, Adela and Ryan who helped to coordinate the uh, the, the webinar series, and Adela who helped with uh, a lot of the slides and. The graphics, as well as Kevin Connolly, uh, who, who did a lot of the work with the, the graphics and pulling together some of the background information about new awards and new faculty hires. Uh, KP, who um, you know heads heads our HR stuff, is is just been instrumental as well. And, and I want to thank them for the role in putting this uh, this presentation together because it's a lot of work. Uh, but but I want to recognize all of our all of our faculty today. Um, Thank you, everybody. Thank you for attending again. Uh, this was uh, a great time to share. And if you have any other comments or suggestions, please do visit our website and leave them with us in our in our IFAM inbox. Um, we we want to receive your feedback and, and be mindful of where you want us to head moving forward. So thank you all and uh, have a good rest of your day.